today talk about reproducible multi-element system composition with Linux, Xen, and Zephyr. And before I get into it, I shortly would like to show the environment in which I'm working. So uh, the project I'm in, we call ourselves Embedded IoT Linux at Bosch. It's a lot of embedded topics, and I just took some sample projects which we make use of. And what we do with this project, we see what is the best for different Bosch divisions. And when we talk about people, or with people, sometimes they say, Bosch, this is, I have some home equipment or I have something in my car. But there are many different business units in Bosch which make use of Linux, which creates systems based on Linux. And that's basically where I'm located in and where we try to foster collaboration between the different entities. Uh, I'm called technical business development manager, which basically means I go out, look for partners, topics to collaborate with inside external. So this is the main topic. I got to this position because I spent many years with the ELISA project, got some traces into AGL and other projects. And recently I also became a advisory board member of the Linux Foundation Europe, it was shortly addressed by Jim this morning, who have been my personal Linux history. Oh, this is something I pressed the wrong shortcut, just like this. Where do we go? Right. Uh, I started 2006, so I guess maybe some in the room here have longer history with Linux than I have. My start was actually with Ubuntu, and we, I was an exchange student and set up old or took old PCs from the university, which were no longer used put uh, Linux on it because it was free, available, and maintainable also at this time, and gave it to ex other exchange students who didn't have a laptop notebook at this point in time. So I brought this in there. And this was my, I say my really kickoff of Linux, ignoring the Unix time before. Regarding automotive, uh, I'm doing this for more than 10 years. Our first product within uh, car multimedia area was on a 2.628 kernel, I guess. Uh, Actually, this is also the head unit which runs on it. So there's really, if you know what you're doing, you can still get the root access for it and the shell to it. That was a different time at these days. But uh, even if you have, you cannot do anything because all the critical things are running on an RTOS, which sounds like a bit of more complex composition. And for this, let's now take a look into the ELISA work and the reproducible system architecture. I have a little bit of disclaimer in the beginning, which is important to understand. I always start that, well, if you have attended the previous session also, it was going about how system requirements work, system properties, and assessing whether a system is safe always requires to understand the system sufficiently. This means it doesn't end. If you are interested in Linux, it doesn't mean it ends with Linux. If you're interested in Zephyr or a hypervisor, it doesn't end with it. You need to see the surroundings. You need to bring it into a context. And what we do in Elisa is we try to understand Linux within that system context. We want to bring it together and how also Linux is used in the system. And if you reach this point, you will see Linux consists of a lot of components and features. And these need to be evaluated for safety. Are they relevant? Not can they interfere? Well, that's the next level of looking into it. And when you look into it, you most likely identify gaps because, well, originally Linux also a lot of other open source software was not written with safety in mind, with the intention to use it in functional safety use cases. And here, there's in the handout, there are some bullet points also. I will not mention them all here. What I wanted to mention is that if you compare Linux to a traditional safety critical OS, there are fundamental differences. So if you think about a commercial art or safety certify, you typically think about a full development process. It has been qualified maybe to an ISO 26262, an IEC 615.02, or whatever standard. And yeah, it brings hard real-time capabilities. For Linux, we're much closer. There are the preempt RT patches getting in there. You can see that the patch level is going down, so we are in a good stabilization phase for this, most likely. Still, uh, even then, you don't get the hard real-time Depending to whom you talk to, they say even with an artist, you don't get hard real time, you only get it with bare metal. But uh, still, this is one part. But what you see is you see a large challenge upcoming. So you hear about software defined vehicles, software defined industry, everything gets larger, you have more computation power, so you get more and more elements in. And for this, suddenly you see the Linux world. Maybe from the one side, and you see, okay, I have 
talented engineers and their kernel maintainers discussed, I can bring it to almost every hardware which I want. I will find board support drivers, packages, I have a massive amount of infrastructure, skilled engineers for free, more or less, because they bring it in and I don't have to pay for it. And that makes it attractive to use it for systems. But you see on the other side this strong part about here's my Artos, safety certify, what will I do? If you're coming from the safe artist side, you also see this challenge because you see, oh, I see how I have multi-cores, multi-level caches, I have variants of my devices, and I need to do the development again and again and again and again. This morning I had a short discussion where it says, oh, we make big business currently with porting GPU drivers to real-time OS because there is an upgrowing demands from customers to have it and they don't want to go to Linux. And now we can port all the existing GPU drivers from Linux on Artus. So this is one part in there. And there are also some limitations, which we will never achieve within the ELISA project, which others may do. Uh, so what we would say is when we work and all the tools we provide, we will not be able to guarantee that the system which you create will be safe because you have your environment in which you operate. And we can also not guarantee that the processes which are described are fully set up. Also, the third item is maybe very important. We will not create an out of tree module because there's so much going on, so many patches which are in, you need to have a continuous certification pass. You cannot just say, here is my version. There is an urban legend. I haven't found the reference so far. Someone said there was a company in UK, I guess, who did a qualification of the 2.4 kernel. It was before there was a safety standard as such, but they did this 2.4 kernel work. They were close to sell the product and then there was a 2.6 kernel and nobody wanted to have the 2.4 kernel anymore. So they couldn't make the business out of it because certification policy were taking too long. And yeah, so this means you have still a lot of reliabilities and responsibilities, obligation, which you need to follow. And the Lisa project just is a way to provide a path forward to collaborates with peers, and these peers are set from different industries. We have a lot of automotive partners in there. We have strong driving aerospace uh, with Intel and Reddit, also some more wider partners which are acting in multiple industries. We collaborate with the automotive great Linux. I come to this also later, and a little bit with the civil infrastructure platform. Well, these are partners in here. And if you get so many people together, you need to come to a certain mission which you bring in there and say this is to what we subscribe. And these are a set of elements, processes, tools which are later on amenable to safety certification. So all what we are doing tries to bring this path forward. And you soon figure out that you don't do it in a full group, you will split up into several working groups and we have horizontals in there. The horizontals basically will cover various use case areas so one is the safety architecture. Here, people will look into the Linux kernel, analyze subsystems. Uh, one of the first parts were, for example, looking into the watchdog subsystem, which we were using for uh, a reference use case. This is done in safety architect. They also doing uh, certain tools in there for visualization of dependencies and so on. Then in the Linux features, this is more a work group which looks like you would treat security. So if you look about security, there's C group, namespaces, Mac, DAC, all these kind of features. Nobody tells you how to really do this and how to combine them and how it guarantees to be secure. But these are elements in there. And we know there are people who are skilled in safety, they are skilled in Linux, and they can yeah, have benefits by getting search and search such features. What this group currently does is they improve the work on the preempt RT patches, the real-time capabilities of the Linux kernel, and update documentation, try to bring this forward. Tools investigation, code improvement, this is a group which will look on the processes which are using, like uh, system theoretic process analysis, also how we work inside ELISA, that we make uh, traceability design work and so properly. They also brought us closer with the system theoretic process analysis, so STPA, if you haven't heard about it, it's a very nice tool for complex systems. I guess I'm not covering it here, but there's a bunch of material from Elisa also outside, and it uh, came originally from the MIT. Right, then uh, I think I just started the open source engineering process for tools investigation, code improvement. This is one 
major element from this presentation together with the systems work group. So we were setting up a CI system and went into testing uh, and bringing different use cases together. Also, there were topics like fuzzy testing, code checker, and so on, which were general. So we have a set server for this setup. And yeah, that's about this. This goes into verticals. The vertical, the newest one, is the aerospace. Aerospace is not that easy yet, so there's still a lot of work going on. Uh, getting use cases together, see where it's in use. We know that there's Linux in use in aerospace, but some things are more confidential on the NDA, and we now draw the direction in there. Then for automotive, uh, yeah, we concentrate on the instrument cluster from AGL. That's the image which you can just see. It's the second use case, but it's not bound to it. We basically had something where we need to derive our requirements, demands to the system because we cannot simply create everything out of context. We need to have some assumption on where we work on. The third group is on the medical devices. This is uh, an open APS use case, which they were analyzing. It is an open source based artificial pancreas system. This was developed based on scriptings on Raspberry Pi, saying simplified word, without uh, really being by a medical device manufacturer, it was driven by open source. And this was really nice because you could, you're not bound with NDAs like typically for automotive or so you could really openly work together. Right. Uh, and then if you see this work groups, which brings us closer to the system composition, which we had, they contribute to different elements. And most of the work groups contribute in this kind of red area. So it's directly on the Linux and assume that People work in this environment, work on Linux, and at some point of time, they would say, I'm done now. I just looked into my Linux subsystem element, and then I bring it into the world. And the world is not a natively running Linux anymore these days. You will see that there are container technologies involved. There may be a cloud connection, which I haven't drawn here. But at least, even if you don't have this involved, there's typically always a microcontroller. There could be interference of hardware. There could be another operating system. It could be an artist, could be an Android system if you're on infotainment domain. And especially in automotive, more and more things get centralized. Right, there's tooling around this. And uh, so all these need to be covered also by a proper open source engineering process so that you say these are all going in hand. You can re-identify things. And to really bring this into use, into comparison, then you have the use cases around it. So. So it's a collaborative work, and we were not doing it alone with Elisa. We also added other projects in there. So the collaboration which we have is with uh, the Xen project, the Fire project, which is there in the beginning. But we also reached out to uh, AGL, I mentioned, but also to the SOFI part, an ARM initiative on the software defined vehicle. They work on mixed criticality use cases, so they also have. Uh, Artists involved, virtualization involvement, similar also for software defined vehicle of Eclipse Foundation, touching it from different perspectives but on a similar level. Last outreach was on Yocto for bull tooling, the SPDX. SPDX is there. We figured out that we need also software bill of material for safety parts, and we had a special interest group created yeah, for completion. We also discussed with Leonardo. And we all did this because they. Um, yeah, if you have an apple and I have an apple and we both exchange the apples and each of us has still one apple, but if we exchange an idea, then we have at the end two ideas. And yeah, what we learned in this discussion was it started basically a year back. Reproducing these systems is problematic. I don't know who of you had listened to the Google keynote this morning. There was the topic about testing and that you need to automate your build. And even if you are automating your build, someone using your component is not uh, able to build it and you need to do all the trials. And I think that's where we are. A year back, it came like this, uh, that Stefano Stabilini went up with a demo in Austin at the Open Source Summit. What he had is, I, he said, I'm presenting features since a long time, but the people ask me, how can I use these features? And then he created a demo session where it's a little bit like a tutorial recording saying you're doing this and that, and this is the way how he experienced features with then. And in the setup, he put exactly these architectural elements of Linux, Linux, so real-time Linux, Sapphire, and Xen. 
Um, but he didn't care on how the Linux was generated. He just said, grab you a, a Yocto generated or whatever image, grab your root file system, grab a kernel image, get a Zephyr, because his focus was also on the Xen subsystem. He just wanted to bring things in. If you're interested in this part, it's a very nice one. Uh, it was also with a lot of, so it's not enough to just look into the slides. It makes sense to watch into the recording because he was going into the system. He was doing this on his PC with QEMO. And that brings us to the next point. A product will run on real hardware. And whenever you go somewhere and say, well, this is my PC, here runs a VM, this may be nice for the server guys, but if you go to embed it, if you go to someone, you want to touch something, you want to have a single board computer or whatever, you just want to touch and feel. This is where we went on and said, okay, let's look where we can go to. And we did a hardware selection. We put in a lot of efforts and we were close to having it reproducible, documented, and so on. This was prepared by our developer first, and then we brought it forward. We got it into the tools group. They set up the, started to set up the CI, and suddenly reality hit us. What we had is we got, went to hardware. The hardware was not available to everybody, and for the hardware selection, we said, what is the best hardware to choose? So we were looking for hardware where there's Xen support, where there's the Fire support, where there's well, Linux support is almost everywhere. Then we saw the real-time Linux, which Stefano was doing, but we wanted to get some visualization in there. So we had a graphics interface with the instrument cluster and so on. And we used tools, brought things up. And now the critical part comes, there were proprietary graphics driver. And this ended up that, well, Whenever you have this hardware at hand, this was an automotive hardware, if you have it at hand, you can get these drivers, but still you need to download them, you need to sign an evaluation agreement, parts of it may be under NDA, and if you want to have it fully open, then it's hard to achieve. So, and this is, say, well, we had to take a step back, and yeah, my original intention when I handed this in, when I did the submission, I thought I can present you the full setup of this hardware, but it would be cheating because nobody here can reproduce what I have presented there. But we came close, so we added different operating systems, we had graphics running, we had all this achieved, so our proof, proof of concept at a local desk worked, but maybe we start with uh, a little bit less in the beginning. So what we see as less is if you look at kind of a production line, um, we have a setup now where we use GitHub for sources. There is a called Meta Elizer. It's based from the automotive work group and it gets built regularly on a GitLab CI runner. And the CI runner also interacts with our tool server, which also does code checking for the testing and so on. And when the system is built, it went into an open QA testing to make sure that whatever is built on a daily basis gets really checked as well. So you see this little icon there below. I guess I've also separate slide on this cluster comparison. And what makes it, I mean, that's something which everybody of you most likely are aware of, what you have done, uh, maybe you know from other examples. So setting this up is nothing special maybe, but where I see a little difference in what we're doing is that the things are tightly coupled. So basically the metalizer layer is a description and the description of the meta Eliza, how you go step by step is a map to how the docker file is constructed the docker file is there to create the docker image and it's not only that you can create a docker image out of it this exactly image from the docker file is the input also for the gitlab build image so whenever you would change something in the docker file or the docker image because of either an update in the system, the environment, this becomes visible by the build image. So you see it directly the next day. We build it once per night and then we move on. We use also S-state cache for Yocto build because otherwise it would take you a long, long time to build. It's 100 gigabytes or whatever. And by this, we're much faster. We don't trust in it. So we also do rebuilds of the full sources because you could say, what could go wrong over the time? It's like when you take a Debian image, uh, try to rebuild it from scratch rather than just doing the incremental packages approach, you most likely hit something which you didn't expect. And 
the good thing about this reproducible part is we have different people coming in into the group and they come from a different perspective. So there's maybe someone who said, oh, you generate this QEMO image. I put it on my PC because I want to do an analysis of a workload, whatever, directly inside, my, inside the system. But I don't care about the previous steps. While we also just recently have a new joiner who said, I said, oh, the easiest way for you would be to start with the Docker file. And he said, no, no, I start the hard way. I start with the description from the beginning. And I know that most likely something will be different to what I have in my environment because that's just logical. But I will update then the description and let you know. So he figured out that there was one Yocto link which didn't update it because they changed the structure of their web page and so on. So this is the element in there. And the OpenQA also became quite important. So the OpenQA testing grabs the generated QEMO image. Uh, was to mention that it updated every day, but the link remains more or less the same, but you will always just get the latest image. And what happened on 7th of April, more or less, uh, it was the se second time that it hits us. We had a build, we had a booting system, but our modification, which is basically rendering a danger sign for if the warning, as a warning sign into a cluster, didn't come up anymore. And we did a longer analysis, and then, because it was not properly put in the logs, we saw that there was a client server certificate expired. So while this has failed, we raised a ticket and it was quite soon then also resolved a few days later. Um, the full setup, description of this, there is a blog post on this, slides are already uploaded, so you can just grab this. And this gets you then the full enablement of the items. This also mentions one more element, which I would like to say as a benefit. Um, last, what was last week discussion? There was one of the engineers said, oh, I wanted to try out something since a longer time. And this trial was uh, just some new features. And said, but I miss, I have computation performance, but I miss the hard disk space currently. I have no space on my device to do another Yocto build of the 100 gigabyte. And I said, oh, do you know that you can simply just branch off, create a pull request, or just, even, you don't even need to pull request, you just need to have a branch, and then you go to the GitLab, change a line for the CI, and it builds the whole thing for you, and you can just see even if the test is still passing. And this is like a low entry hurdle for those who say, oh, I don't bring the computation performance, I have something tried out, bring it just forward. So this is something which was really in there, and here, I thought here's the OpenQA testing that also comes then with uh, boots lock, so you can see how the system booted. You get a serial console output because we have an interface on serial console command line interface. You also get a video recording of what has been done over the time so that you um, yeah, also can see if something went wrong. Right. So overall, this means we have a bunch of starting points, so we can reproduce the image. And the nice thing is this was the one path, we had the second path in the system more complex architecture, and this more complex architecture, we had the first run, which worked locally, so now it's like bringing the things together. Even the CI was prepared for this multi-setup until the point of now I create and flash an image. And yeah, so this is basically what we see. I mentioned here also that Part of the direct starting point, right? So then, now we say we start all over again, our new hardware. And I'm also happy if someone is here and say, "Oh, that's a bad choice. Go for another one." Uh, we will go currently for the XU 102. That's Xilinx hardware. It's also a little bit in the ages. It's not the latest one, but it brings very close ARM reference implementation to us. So this is a benefit for being more transferable to other architectures because if we would go for a proprietary, let's say, system MMU implementation or whatever, then it's not as much wide usable as when you have a very close to reference implementation part. What we see as a major drawback of this part is that one, the GPU level, the GPU is uh, not as good as like on more recent automotive hardware which is done for, which would be much better for a cluster or infotainment, whatever way you want to handle it. But the nice thing about this hardware is currently that um, there is a successor version of it, a CREA hardware setup, and this is for AI applications, for robotics, 
And this gives a chance on a very low cost one. This XU is a very expensive hardware. It's like three, $3,000 plus or so if you want to purchase it. It's available, but expensive. And this will not scale on a community base later on. So the community scale will be with a lower cost hardware like an Ultra 96 board. Uh, in the other work group, there was discussion on Orange Pi, but we wanted to have also something where there's a microcontroller there, where we can have Xen support or virtualization support. And that's where we start with. Another benefit of this is that this is available to also Xen maintainers, and it can also support Zephyr. It's very cl much closer to the demo of Stefano from the past. And the main reason we didn't choose it was because it was no reference hardware from AGL, and we wanted to have more graphics performance. But we also see the movement towards telematics, other systems where you typically don't need the graphics performance for rendering things. And by this, we can move forward, have a wider use case, no possibilities. We can migrate the hardware with a good BSP support. The Korea is brand new. But as I said, we are not fixed to it. If we get a better approach, if there is another hardware, so we were also looking like for NXP, TI part. What for us is important, it has an open, GPU, open source GPU driver that we don't fall into the same issue again. We can discuss with other maintainers from open source GPU drivers and don't need to talk directly to GPU providers. And yeah, this gives a start on this hardware. I hope that we're good in presenting this in June. So I give another try at the Embedded Open Source Summit in Prague, this time from uh, my colleague who's doing a lot of engineering work there. And yeah, we're just on this part. What comes also in there as some next steps, I guess SBOM is uh, something which is important and attractive to many. So we do the SBOM generation. What we also were considering to switch on reproducible builds elements. Um, I haven't listed this in here, but this was important for us. Then, yeah, there was the original reproduction. This is the ongoing <coughs> activity. Uh, there is an RT Linux cell in there, but we will go there and document this part so that you can really just go step by step wise. You can say, I just start from source, I take a Docker file, I go to the GitLab, I go, I just take binaries, I just bring it on the hardware. I don't have a hardware, so I have a QAMO option. Well, this is basically the step where we continue. If you get a first, want to get a first, we check the work in progress pull request, but it's on a very initial phase because it never reached something like we did before where an engineer starts. A second engineer takes over the results, improve the documentation. Someone, both engineers look at it after a month. I really recommend to look at your documentation after a month. If you haven't done things, then bring it over to someone new. And this is basically how we approach the whole thing, but we couldn't do with the proprietary graphics driver. Um, we will go for other Linux distros because although a bunch is there with Yocto, you may come with the Debian part, so that's why a purchase in CIP I'll list it here as well. We did actually this already on the old demo. So this worked also to replace the domain, the, the Linux domain was another one and still see graphics and so on. This was on the other hardware. We, are, we believe it will work also on the new one. And yeah, the last important part is if we have it on this XU 102, which is a $3,000 board, so nobody will buy it if you don't have it in your company, but we want to be open for other communities and therefore we look for community hardware. Now could actually be also a good time to just say, oh, I know the perfect hardware which has Zephyr XN, or let's say RTOS virtualization and Linux support, and it's low price and available, then uh, this would be also a chance to just swap, but for now, I guess we go with this one. And this basically can also show you an evolutionary path, so you, see that all the work which we're doing is not directly related to safety. And the ELISA project mainly covers the topic of enabling links and safety application, and that's where it started. But if you want to experience a use case, you need to put it again in this wider system context. And this is what we see here. And even if you just have a smaller use case that's called telltales for, this is, these are the warning signs within an instrument cluster. This has safety implication because it's important that your check engine sign goes on, that your gear indicators properly, if the oil pressure is not correct, that's, these are all warnings uh, which need to be there, need to be shown, and if they wouldn't pop up, you have an issue, and this can become life critical in the end, although a bunch of us may ignore the first appearance of this message. And if you think one step further, what happens in there is that 
you could extend the use case to go for park distance control, for example, then you don't have maybe your engine which records put on this light, but you will have an ultrasonic sensor which sends a signal and say, make the beep. And from the beep, then you can add the camera, you get more real-time capabilities, and we get a scaling use case. And the funny thing about it is, even if you start with this first small use case, this will already run in systems where suddenly virtualization comes into place, container technology come into place, Artis comes into place, because there's almost no automotive ECU which runs a microprocessor which will not have a microcontroller next to it which interoperate. And we see these use cases also from other topics like lawnmowers, uh, industrial robots, and we just see that more and more computation performance is needed over time. And this brings the composition of complex systems and you need to face this complex system architecture and need to reproduce this, right? You can get involved from many different points within the project. So we have a bunch of mailing lists, almost with every part from the mailing list, you will also find a working group meeting. Some are US friendly, like the systems work group. Then if you, being in Asia, the automotive part could be more interesting and it's good overlap of 50% so that you update it with both sides and you can also contribute to both. Right, yeah, by this, uh, I would conclude this presentation. I want to say, don't miss the next session. So after lunch, there's the session from uh, Stefano Stabilini and Zentu Kumar. They talk about the safety certifying of Xen. I guess it's also a follow-up of our last year's discussions. And uh, we're looking forward to this. By this, I guess we can go over to questions. Anyone brings a question? You get a, you get a. You're assuming that uh, the Yocto build is completely reproducible, but it's not. So, yeah, it's in a good state. I mean, if you see what you can do, you cannot, the reproducible builds project is also not fully completed in there, but we are much closer to it. There are just a few things and it doesn't need to be the Yocto part in there. And also mainly, or what could be a large issue, if we get it fully reproducible, this gives us a much better argumentation for the tools we have in use. And you have a harder argumentation as long as you build once and you build a second time, it's not exactly the same. But at least we're much closer on this. And it's also not about making here a safety certification within the LISA, but to help others who work with Linux. And they may not go with Yocto, they may go with others, or they have their way around it, or they are much further in the reproducible build part, you don't see anything. Kate, you want to add something? <laughs> yeah, um, I'd actually be interested in having you ta chat with Richard Purdy, because actually Yocto is fully reproducible to the extent that they, at least that's what Richard's been telling me. And so um, to the extent that they even factor the time stamps, and they're using the whole S state system for making some of this stuff possible. And so. There's a lot of work that's gone into it. So I'm curious while you say it's not fully reproducible. And so, but I'm not the expert to have that discussion with as well. I recognize that. So I think um, understanding why are you seeing a limitation, I think would be a good follow-up discussion. Uh, it's basically a simple concept that uh, if you actually use it, exactly the same computer, exactly the same distribution to build the base of Yocto, then the same compiler, then you can get the resulting parts, then you can say that's reproducible. But if you get the same layers and build in a completely different distribution, you will not get exactly the same result because the compiler will change the definition. So uh, it's partially reproducible if you keep the same thing. This is the same issue that we have for the safety qualification. Yeah. If you change it left or right, it's not the same anymore. That's also yeah. quite funny to mention because uh, I can keep it on. So what I saw was that when you take the AGL Yocto also, it's downloading the version of the compiler, that the version which the compiler version also fully matches. So there are a lot of these elements in there which try to make it better. Um, if, and what you also said, if you exchange it to somewhere else, but I'm pretty sure when you create something for your safety certification, we'll do also it in your environment as an integrator, and this makes you a selling point. And then it's not also not intended that someone there is the obligations from licenses, which you may have to a certain extent, but it's not intended that someone builds exactly the safety product again on it. Yeah. Oh, this was bright. <laughs> uh, 
It was a very good talk. Thank you. Um, clearly knowing yourself. Um, in, in aerospace, uh, when we want reproducibility and stuff like that, we actually have to qualify the tool by a DO330. Normally, we don't do that. Uh, for like DAL D and E, we'll do, we just, we don't care. It doesn't even, we don't even care about reproducibility, actually. We just care that functional test passes. And then for CBNA, we just have to do all the way up to MCDC coverage and those things. So reproducibility in that situation is really not about reproducing the binary. And even, even with the binary, yep. One thread's going to finish faster than the other. You root it fast. You're, you can't just check some. It won't work that way, no matter what. There's no such thing as true SHA-256 summary reproducibility. That will never happen unless you have you know, everything marked up. But at least you can say, all my tests pass, and I, all, all my requirements pass. So I guess that's a long-winded way of saying, in like 26262 and all that, is it the same way where you just have to show that your tests pass, or do you actually have to go further back and show that your environment is compliant? And the tests pass in the final target, not in the environment. Yeah, correct. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a functional test in the integrated environment. So does that also apply in, in, in automotive? Yeah, so for the automotive part, if you, you typically have the tool qualification and you will do a tool qualification and then the topics like reproducible build projects and other will be very useful because this is actually where salt get modified and the argumentation gets incredibly hard if you would like to say, well, you know, I have here something which is certifiable but every binary will look different, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not possible. I heard once a nice story where for railways, where they had to construct something and they were very close and they out, figured out that they had, to, they had this, the drawings from certain things. And they said, okay, how do we get it? So they soldered the different pieces together and then they put it into a box and said, okay, when someone sees what we've just soldered, this will not be good. So they, and they need to be robust in the railways. So they put in uh, some epoxy whatever in there, and then they put a cover around it. The best thing about it was in the certification phase, they <laughs> x-rayed this. And now later on, every model had to be x-rayed. <laughs> and having the, the number was quite low, but the x-ray picture had to look in the same way because it has to be reproducible from the hardware setup. And it was some, just some last minute fix, which was equivalent but it's very hard to argue that this is equivalent if it just looks a little different, right? Even if the circuit is the same. And that's what we have with the software bills then as well. I want to add one point for the Yocto part, which uh, some people say I go with Debian because there the risk is much lower when you have something set up and you will just build your component on top because you will go from a binary base because never underestimate what a developer could do, what a system integrator could later on do. And, uh, yeah, but then even then this doesn't avoid to have maybe binary patches in there, but this will be then you have a certified one and you can see that something changed and the changes are properly, yeah. Okay, another question. Cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I kind of started to, because you know, uh, first time to hear um, Elisa, and very, you know, very good, very impressive, and it's kind of um, related to our our company that you know is kind of um, safety critical. Mm -hmm. um, but in, on top of safety, we also kind of you know um, needs need to be re real time. So I'm wondering in our, yeah. your you know yeah. So this is something uh, when we started the use cases, um, we don't have the real time part in there from the automotive because. If we start when you start two years back, also the RT patches and the Linux kernel one. And it depends on your use case how much real time real time you need, right? If you say I need a one microsecond guarantee, it can be also potentially better to also have a system architecture where Linux gets some part and where you add other components because you cannot give a one hundred percent guarantee under below microsecond with the Linux kernel. As far as I see it, <laughs> it might be someone else thinks. But um what we did already, we are currently improving the documentation part of it. One of the work groups really looks into the RT part. We will most likely also evolve on use cases. And I guess, are the real-time patches enabled in the open APS? Um, because I saw some, R no, I, because I thought I saw some RT on, patches. Hang on, hang on. remember, let's, like, see, we're, we're, we're talking quite a large variant of time. We're speaking of minutes, it's not microseconds. The open yeah, APS. right. Yeah. And, 
Just buy it? Well, it was just pre k that was left. Yeah. yeah. But it basically means depending on your use case, which you bring in, we need to see how much real time, real time you need. So I, I was talking to people also in Artos, it's not a real time. Real time just is there when you do bare metal programming. And, uh, but I see other industries which said from, oh, finally we can use Linux and get rid of our alternative solution because real time is enabled in Linux. And it depends then on your product because they came from industrial mm -hmm. tracks and then they are coming in 100 microseconds, millisecond range and say, but we need to guarantee this frame and suddenly there is real time enough for their production steps. So this is. Um, is there any um, other open source you know, um, platform or community that is kind of supporting um, this, you know, real, like hard real time, um, you know? Hard or real time, definitely yeah. with the, the Xen talk is in there later on for the virtualization topic and the Artos. The Zephyr, the Zephyr project is mm -hmm. also in, and both, that's what, why we collaborate is both have a safety track, a safety certification pass. They're on the way. They, all, all of us, all the three projects, not always take exactly the same approach towards safety, but we have a lot of overlap. So I recommend the Zephyr project as an Artos, which has a huge board support and it brings you the pass towards also Linux usage because you have kconfig in there, you have device trees and so on. So you will, if you know a little bit about Linux, you will get much more confident with the work and fast ramp up in Zephyr other way around. If you start with the Zephyr artist, it ease you the way towards Linux. And it's because many mechanisms are in there. They have a safety part, they are artists, but it may end up with certain complexity. If you have a very complex product, then you would say, okay, I may go into certain rendering or a certain workload parts I put on my Linux system. I can argue that they are just quality managed, means they have no safety integrity level. Or you can also argue with the argumentation, say, this is not the RT critical part. I have it in there and I use watchdog, I would monitoring. That's how we do from our use case. We cannot guarantee the scheduling on real time as we have now. So therefore we put a watchdog which triggers and say, okay, I figured out scheduling was not achieved and therefore I can go in safe state. But this also depends on your use case, of course, if you're allowed to go into safe state. If you have a drone, maybe for example, and then just switching off the drone may not be good because it can harm people anyway. Right? <laughs> so this is just, while uh, for other example, with the instrument cluster, you can switch it off, turn it black, reboot, and there will be not really a harm or anything happening. So this depends really on the use case. We can discuss and see how far we can get, where we can help. Cool. Then I guess it's close for lunchtime. Thanks a lot.